Welcome to Summit Church. My name is Kaylee Newkirk. And I'm Jessica Meyer. And we are just so glad that you're joining us for worship today, whether that's individually from a computer screen or you're with a house church or a small group or joining us from 33rd. Thank you for doing church with us today. If you're new with us, we would love to get to know you. There's a little link uh, below this video that you can click. It says Get Connected. It will be linked to the description if you're watching on YouTube. Please click that because we would love to know who you are. Um, we'd love to have the opportunity to answer any questions you have about Summit to tell us, to tell you a little bit about us and, and really just to get to know you. Well, Kaylee, I don't know if you know this, but Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. And you know it's right before Christmas? Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Uh, and we are so excited to offer a couple different options for Christmas Eve service this year. One will be an online service, and we're actually premiering it on YouTube um, at 1 p.m. on Christmas Very Eve. Very exciting. And it has a live chat feature, a right? live chat, yes. But you have to be present at 1 p.m. to yes. join the live chat, right? Yes. So you just hop on at 1 p.m. on YouTube, um, and you can join the chat. I'm going to be there. Are you going to be there? I'm going to be there. Um, can't wait. Um, but if you can't join at 1 p.m., no worries if you're not able to attend the 1 p.m. start time because it'll be on demand on our website and on YouTube the rest of the day. There's also uh, going to be an in-person service, right? You're right. There is an in-person service, and we are so excited about this. Our whole Summit congregation to the Dr. Phillips Center um, of Performing Arts for a special outside, socially distant um, worship service. They built the venue just for stuff like this, right? They totally did, and it it's going to be pods, and yes. everyone's separated, yes. but socially together. Socially distanced, <laughs> yes, and it's going to be awesome. Um, and our services will be at 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. on Thursday, December 24th. Space is limited, though, so they have to reserve their pod as soon as possible. Right. Yes, please go onto our website, summitconnect.org, to reserve your pod because RSVPs are required um, and you have to have a ticket to attend this event. So speaking of Christmas Eve, also if you've been with Summit any length of time, you know that every year we are able to give away our entire Christmas Eve service to a local or global partner organization. And this year we are partnering with Up Orlando United Against Poverty because they believe that that poverty is not a permanent condition, that people can move away from those circumstances of poverty into places of stability. And so we're really excited to partner with them. If you were here with us last year, you know that we gave that offering mm -hmm. to Young Life Light of Orlando. Um, and they uh, and Michelle was here and she was able to talk to us about all the things that she was gonna do with that money. Now, the pandemic came in and kind of changed some of those mm -hmm. plans, but they were still able to do a lot of the stuff. Yeah, they were still able to have Young Life Classroom, which was a place that students that were um, doing distance learning were able to come and they had the Such internet and food idea. and a safe place to be able to study um, in a socially distant way. And also just uh, get out of the house, which was Absolutely. a gift to the parents as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just something to do. Mm -hmm. And also just they had the opportunity to keep doing ministry, which wasn't a possibility for all the ministries in Orlando. So we're really excited that we got to partner with them in that way. Michelle is going to be delivering a video message for us in just a moment here to talk to you about some of the stuff that was able to happen. So would you watch this with us? Well, let me just say this. I feel like I've been on the longest spring break ever. Let me just... <laughs> I have the distinct pleasure and opportunity of being the area director of Light of Orlando Young Life, who serves our urban and our vulnerable communities in the city of Orlando. Those students are students that come from hard family backgrounds, um, low income areas, um, parents where their one of their parents or both of their parents are incarcerated, or they've lost a parent um, too soon. And what we get to do is bring light and love to the campus and light it up so much so that the darkness flees in the lives of kids and kids of color um, and teenagers every single day. When the pandemic hit, um, we were fortunate enough that the gift afforded us to not have to blink an eye or skip a beat or even worry about how we're going to make sure that these kids are good. To, 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 to honestly not have to skip a beat and worry about how we're going to even function during a hard time as everyone would. God blessed us with a gift that we can just keep moving forward and caring for his people. 
God, you're so good. We wanted to meet the needs of the students. So we scratched club and Young Life Classroom is, we created a space where we have club from during the school day where students who are distance learning, they can come to us. We're providing a space where they're getting internet, they're safe, we're providing food, we're providing transportation, providing parents the opportunity to have a break, we're giving students the opportunity to be someplace outside of home and to be able to be it where they're gonna get that love, joy, peace, and hope. Um, and then after that, we have campaigners with those students. We'll get right into the Bible and just going deep, letting the Word of God speak. And that has been rich. Kids are being sharpened by the Word of God and they don't even know it. That's victory, man. Um, because they're learning how to use God's Word right in the midst of everything that they're doing. One thing that we definitely need, um, as my board and I are just dreaming, our idea would be to be have eight leaders per school. God has given me the opportunity, and just in my territory, minimum, bare minimum, to be in 10 schools. If you want to volunteer. I would love Summit for a prayer, a growth prayer team. Pray for good relationships with the schools, Pray for a board, pray for the resources to be able to do that, and just pray for the next kid that we can go to. I will love prayers because things happen when we pray and everything starts in prayer. Thank you so much for believing in me and believing in what God has called us to do and believing in the lives of the kids that we're changing. So as you can see, the money that uh, you give for the Christmas Eve offering really does make a difference. It really does matter. And so we hope that you'll consider, uh, if you're able, we hope that you'll consider partnering with us again this year as we give that offering to Up Orlando. If you want to know more about them, there's a link in the description, but also you can just go to their website, Up Orlando, um, and check out what they're all about. And all information about Christmas Eve offering will be um, given at the Christmas Eve service, whether online or in person. So we're going to be continuing now um, in our sermon series, Nativity Stories. And if you think about it, uh, when you picture a nativity, right, you picture all the people who are central to bringing Jesus into the world. So Mary and Joseph, his parents, and the shepherds, uh, and, and, and the, the wise men, the magi who traveled to find him, and of course the angels who heralded his birth. And so in this sermon series, we're going to be looking at each one of these people and, and exploring uh, who they are and how they helped usher Jesus into the world. And today we'll be hearing from Waterford Campus Pastor Gary Abbott, and he'll be talking about the joy we find in Joseph's story. We're also going to continue in worship through the giving of tithes and offerings. Now, if you're new with us, please know that no one asked you here for your money. It's been our prayer all week that this service would be a gift to you. But if you are a partner at Summit, if you're a member of the body of Christ anywhere, you know why we give. We give out of obedience to scripture and we give out of a clarity of vision that God really can use our temporary and finite resources to build his infinite and eternal kingdom. So would you join us in worshiping the God who is the reason for our joy?
arms of God we find our strength in the arms of God we find our strength Joseph, son of Adam, image bearer of the Creator, inherited Adam's sin, the need for a Savior, and the promise of a man greater who would crush the serpent's head and the curse and restore righteousness to all the earth. Joseph, son of Abraham, father of a nation, who followed God to an unknown destination, looked with faith-filled eyes towards the promise prized and believed in the gift he wouldn't leave to receive. Joseph, son of David, who sang psalms of praise, dream of a temple he wasn't worthy to raise, but was given through the prophet a promise of his own, a king for David's line on an everlasting throne. And on and on through their whole family history, on one single trajectory, an imperfect nation given a glimpse of coming salvation. And yet, when Mary... Joseph's future bride declared prophecies fulfilled before our eyes, and in her womb the Son of the Most High. 
It was easier for Joseph to believe that Mary was deceived than that God would come down. Come now. After centuries of silence, of living under the heels of tyrants, of laboring under the impossible weight of the law, all the teachings and prophets who had come before, when had he stopped holding his breath, stopped looking for Messiah who would overcome death, would not see decay, would wash the stain of sin away. Joseph, son of Jacob, named God will increase, carrying the burdens God had yet to ease, couldn't take in the tidings of grace unceasing. Instead, he stood disbelieving. Joseph, walking in darkness, was interrupted by light. He saw the angel in his dreams that night, saying, Be not afraid. Be ready for grace. Take Mary and the baby as your own son to raise. Name him Jesus. God saves. Saves from darkness to light, from the death and the crimson stain of sin to life, from defeat to delight, perceiving the miracle virgin and child. Did Joseph's heart race wild? Did he dance as his ancestor David had done, overwhelmed by joy before the Holy One? Joseph, son of the promise given through God's own Son to be forgiven. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have in this day to lean into you more than we lean into our own understanding. God, this has been a year that has come with so much uncertainty for so many people. And in so many ways, it, it feels like the weight of, of the world might be on our shoulders uh, this year and particularly this time of year. And so, God, I pray that we remember in these moments that it's not, that, that you bear that weight for us, that we don't have to walk through it alone. And that's what this Advent season reminds us, maybe more than anything else, is that when we feel as though we have to take it all on ourselves, we simply don't have to, because you came to live, to love, to die and rise again so that we know there is life available for us, even in the midst of very difficult circumstances. So I pray that where we find ourselves in uncertainty and in difficult circumstances, we would remember that you are with us and you are for us. And where we find ourselves having come through difficult circumstances, I pray that we would loan that hope to as many people as we possibly can. We pray this as we come to your word and the powerful and redemptive name of Jesus. Amen. Well, today we're continuing to look at those people who are in the nativity scenes that we're so familiar with. Maybe we had one on our uh, a certain place in our home growing up. Maybe uh, our grandparents had one in a certain place, whatever the case may be. Maybe we uh, uh, still look at those and, and they provide some comfort and some hope for us this time of year. But today we're looking at Joseph. He's usually kneeling next to Mary in our nativity scenes, right next to the manger and baby Jesus. And my hope is that when we look at Joseph today, we don't have uh, hope or comfort just out of nostalgia, just out of familiarity, but we have hope and comfort because of how he walked through an impossible circumstance and how that can help us know how to navigate impossible circumstances as well. And for someone who's positioned so prominently in the nativity scenes that we're familiar with, we don't know that much about Joseph. We know in Luke chapter 2, it tells us there's a purification ceremony after the birth of Jesus. This was in line with the Old Testament law when a child was born. And as part of that purification ceremony, you sacrificed a lamb and a bird. And if you couldn't afford a lamb, two birds would suffice. Mary and Joseph offered two birds. They were poor. We also know that Joseph was a carpenter, a tecton in the Greek. A little later in the story, Matthew 13, when Jesus has grown and, and begun his ministry, he goes to his hometown. And the people there are very confused and concerned about the things he's saying about God and about himself and about who he is. And the rationale for that concern was, how could he be who he says he is? Isn't that the carpenter's son? 
The thought was he wasn't significant enough to be an important part of God's story. Along with the verses we're going to look at today, that's really all we know about Joseph. And so there's an important thing for us right here up front. If you find yourself maybe feeling like a supporting cast member in God's story, not the main character, other people are playing a lead role in what God's doing in the world, you're more a supporting cast member, don't resent that. Significance doesn't come from a long biography. It comes from being faithful to the part God asked you to play. So we don't know much about Joseph, but what we learn in Matthew chapter 1, what we're going to spend time with today, is really significant. So let's open that up. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David. Joseph, son of David. I want to stop there uh, for just a moment. The angel addresses Joseph, this relative no one who's, who's poor in a rural community as the son of David. That means he was the great, great, great so on grandson of the great King David, the one who brought the kingdom of Israel to its height, to its peak. And before that, Abraham, the father of God's people. It means Joseph was part of the family that was going to be a unique part of God's plan to redeem the world and save the world. But being a descendant of the great King David in Joseph's day didn't mean power and authority. Power and authority, that was in Rome. The angel visits Joseph in the reign of Caesar Augustus, or Octavian. He ruled uh, from 27 BC to 14 AD, and he brought what was called the Pax Romana to the world. It expanded across the known world. It brought peace and prosperity that had never been seen before. He was hailed as the Prince of Peace. Caesar was, as the deliverer as the bringer of tranquility, he was called the savior of the world. You can have your own gods in these uh, places like Nazareth, but you had to worship Caesar above all else because he's the savior of the world. But that peace brought by that savior was born out of conquest and domination. The Roman uh, authority ruled and they taxed you as they wanted and as long as you stayed in line you were okay but if you didn't you were simply eliminated and how they would bring fear to people like Joseph is from time to time Roman military guards would march into towns like Nazareth where he lived and at the head of the procession would be the Roman eagle the sign of power and at the back of the procession would be a few Roman guards carrying crosses do as we say everything will be fine If not, a cross awaits you. So Joseph lived in the shadow of a cross before Jesus grew to take one on for him. And this oppressive Roman rule, that's actually why Joseph had to take the dangerous 90-mile trip from uh, Nazareth down to Bethlehem, where Jesus was eventually born, because there was a census that was being taken. The Roman authority wanted to know where people were so they could tax them appropriately, and so you had to go to your family's town. Joseph took Mary to Bethlehem, David's town, the great King David's town. But we're not to that part in the story yet. But here's the backdrop. Lack of economic security, no public status, political unrest, foreign occupation, but one more thing as well. Joseph, it's pretty clear from the text, before the angel shows up, believes that Mary has been unfaithful to him because he decides to divorce her. In in Jesus' day, uh, an engagement was was a binding legal marriage. And it's the only reasonable explanation. If you go to the Gospel of Luke, it tells us that Mary, while she's pregnant, travels to the house of the priest Zechariah, where her cousin Elizabeth is is Zechariah's wife, and she spends a significant part of her pregnancy there. And she returns to Nazareth, visibly pregnant. And, and, And Joseph isn't the father. 
Now we know from the scriptures that God is up to something, but all the town folk knew and all that Joseph knew was that Mary had likely been unfaithful. And the law set out in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament said that unfaithfulness was legal grounds for divorce. And so divorce and adultery, those could be very, very public events in the ancient world, particularly in the Jewish ancient world. Uh, think of the woman caught in adultery that's brought before Jesus right in the public square. They kind of lay her in front of the whole town and say, what do you, what do you say? Should we stone her to death? Imagine that type of severity. And so a uh, public divorce would have been a very normal thing. A private divorce would have actually been pretty abnormal. See, Nazareth was this deeply nationalistic Galilean city uh, they were deeply devout to, to the Jewish law. And so in Nazareth, you did things the right way. Your habits, your thoughts, your actions, they were all formed by and steeped in the Old Testament law. And that means a scandal like this would never have gone unnoticed. And there was a thought that even having a couple like this in your city wouldn't just bring judgment on them for being unfaithful to God's law. It actually might bring judgment on the whole town. And so there was almost certain loss of business, ostracization, all of those things. That was, was what was facing Joseph unless he publicly shamed Mary. A private divorce wouldn't have saved face, but even here we get a glimpse of grace and it's important. Verse 19 says that Joseph was uh, faithful to the law, or another way of saying that is he was a righteous man. That's a, that's a way of saying that people recognized his devoutness to God. And the law that G Joseph knew would have given them the freedom to, to publicly divorce Mary for her supposed actions. And it would have been totally normal in the eyes of him and everyone else. But it would have put her in a place of ridicule as an outsider, possibly even put to death. And this is important. He wasn't willing to risk his saving face to put her in danger. See, our righteousness should lead to mercy not wrath. You ever been faced with that challenge before, showing grace and kindness to someone that might lead to ridicule for you, and so you, you have this difficult decision to make? Let me just say this. Our devoutness to God should always lead us to mercy, not wrath. But that's not even the end of the story. Remember the backdrop. Political unrest brought on by a false savior, no social power, no upward mobility, and now public shame, gossip, almost certain loss of business because who wants to do business with people like that? He's living in a poor rural community with nothing more than a difficult story to explain and difficult economic and social position. That's what's right in front of Joseph. Things were not good. And the story of Joseph shows us that you can live a faithful life and still have very difficult circumstances right in front of you. Maybe this year you feel like that. You feel like, God, I've done everything the right way. Why this? Why now? Why do I have to put up with this? And when we feel like that, like maybe we do this year, what are we supposed to do? Well, let's turn to Joseph because Joseph, facing all of that, has what we call in our family a head up moment. My son, Caleb, 15, he runs cross country for Winter Park High School. I love that he runs. I ran cross country in high school. I love cheering him on and watching him train with dedication. I just, I love everything about it. And so I give him coaching from time to time. Now, let me be clear, I'm not the coach. The coach is the coach, I respect that, but I'm just a very involved parent. And so one of the pieces of coaching or advice that I give him often is run head up. Because if you settle for focusing on the shoes of the person in front of you, you think that's all there is to the race. And when you're focused just right in front of you, that's where your breathing becomes labored. That's where every step becomes more difficult. That's where you start to actually lose a little bit of hope that you can move forward. So if you get your head up and you realize there's more to the race, more movement to happen, that's actually where you can move forward. So oftentimes when Caleb passes me during a race, I'll just repeat, head up and go, head up and go, head up and go. This is a head up moment for Joseph. This is don't settle for thinking that all is going on is what's right in front of you. And it shows us that we can live in hopeful anticipation about what's ahead, even if what's right in front of us is so difficult. Matthew chapter 1 continues. After he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord said to him in a dream, 
Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Joseph has this graceful, wise plan to deal with what's right in front of him. Don't shame anyone. Show kindness and mercy and move on. And then an angel appears. Joseph, son of David, essentially saying, hey, if you've forgotten, you're important. You matter. And the angel says, I need you to do something ridiculous. I need you to do something that will lead to all kinds of questions. I need you to do something that will probably make life more difficult for you. I need you to do something that, that maybe you are not ready to do. And so he's faced with this. What does he do? Verse 24, when he awoke, he did as the angel told him to do. He took Mary as his wife. And I think this is absolutely amazing. I mean, why would he do that? Political unrest, we've talked about it. No upward mobility, poor, shamed for his situation. Why would he take all that on? Because he had a head up moment. Remember, Joseph was a righteous man. He knew God and his life and his actions reflected that he knew God and trusted him, that he was a God who was gonna set all things right. He knew that was gonna happen. And so he would have interpreted what he was currently facing in light of the rest of God's story. That's so key to understand what Joseph does. His faith is that God was going to act according to his character. He'd bring salvation, true salvation, to the world. Even if he wasn't certain how it was going to work out, his faith led to actions. He says yes because he got his head up. He looked beyond his circumstances that were right in front of him to remember the things God is up to in this world. And the name that the angel tells Joseph to name this child is a key part of that remembering process for him. Names matter. Uh, My three kids, when Abby and I named our three kids, we, we wanted to give them a blessing with their name. We, we wanted them to know their names were a direction that they could head in this world. Caleb, my oldest son, is is a biblical name. When the Israelites are freed from slavery in Egypt, they wander through the desert. They're on the precipice of the promised land, this land that is good and safe for them where they can be God's display people, Uh, but the land is occupied. And so the Israelites send 12 spies into the land, and the land is good. And they come back and report that. It is amazing. This land that God has promised is so good, but 10 of those spies say, we can't take it. We we can't do it. There are giants there. It's too hard. It's too difficult. But Caleb, along with Joshua, they stand up and, and they say, no, if God has called us to do something, it will be a gross mistrust of a trustworthy God if we don't do it. And so my son's name is Caleb Leo. That's my grandfather's name. Two steadfast, faithful men that were dedicated to follow God. Eden, our daughter, we named her Eden because we wanted her to know that she could display the beauty of who God is just by her very being, just the place, uh, uh, like, like the place Eden did. My son, youngest son, Jos Lee, uh, he came home from Haiti when he was five, and so he's Jos Lee. He's, he is one of a kind, and so we couldn't possibly change his name, but his middle name, we gave him the name Stephen. That's Abby's dad's name, probably the man that reflects the character of Jesus better than anyone I know. Our kids' names are a blessing, and they're meant to to give a direction to their life. The name the angel declares for Mary's baby that Joseph was supposed to give was all about the direction for his life, what he was going to be in this world. The angel says, name him Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. Jesus was actually a pretty common name in the time in ancient Palestine. It's uh, Yeshua, uh, the, the combination of Yahweh and Shua, Yahweh God. Shua works rescue, rescues, saves. It was a common name, but it was a miraculous idea. And the angel says to Joseph, like, you name him. You take some responsibility for this. You take an active role in this process. Declare that God saves and know that it's gonna happen through this child because he, this child, will save the people from their sins. Paul in the New Testament, uh, in Romans, 
says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin, falling short of the glory of God, is death. And I know that's harsh. And you might think, man, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not really ready to hear all that. I'm not, not really interested in all of that. And the reality is when I think of it, I'm pretty good compared to the people around me. I mean, I've got a list of people that are way worse off than I am. You know what? I don't want to argue that point. But when John Wesley, who's the founder of Methodism, when he was a kid, he asked his mom, Susanna Wesley, what is sin? And she responded, sin is anything that separates you from God, separates you from uh, other people, separates you from being the person God has called you to be. That to you is sin. So I'm not going to argue whether you're better or not than the person around you. I'll concede that point. But do you ever think or say or do or desire anything that separates you from God? or from others, or from the person God's called you to be, ever? Professor and theologian Jim McKeon says, sin is usually not where people are weak. It's a misconception. It's not usually where people are weak. It's where people are strong and they don't bother. Jesus telling the story of the Good Samaritan is actually a good example of this. This man is beaten on the side of the road. He's left for dead and religious people walk by one by one and just uh, don't have time to help him. But uh, an outcast, a Samaritan, uh, someone considered not right uh, with God, uh, tends to this man, bandages his wounds, meets his immediate needs, and then pays for his ongoing care. So the religious people that pass this hurt man, this man who needed help, that they pass him by, they sinned because they didn't bother. For Jesus, sin is at least in part a failure to bother, not bother for the vulnerable, not bother for the voiceless, not bother for the people God has given you to love, not bother to be a peacemaker or to be patient or to be kind or to be generous, not bother to better live and love like the God we claim. And the reason we don't is because it's hard because it takes time, it's inconvenient, and honestly, this time of year, we want just a little normalcy, and noticing all of that and bothering with all of that takes us away from this, I just want a normal moment at Christmas. That's why we all put our Christmas lights up on October 15th, and we posted pictures of it with the hashtag, don't judge. That's why we did that, because we want a little normalcy. But failure to bother has consequences. And if none of that is you, if anything that I just said about sin and describing sin, if none of that's you, if you can take an honest look at yourself and, and you say, I don't do anything that separates me from God or from others uh, or, or, or from the person God's called me to be, I don't ever do anything that is counter to God's character. I don't ever forego doing things that would show His love in the world. I'm always ready to do that. I always show His character to my wife and to my kids and to my coworkers and to the person who cuts me off in traffic. I always show His character that way. If that's you, you don't need a Savior. You don't need Jesus. You don't need Emmanuel. You don't need a God who is with us, who came to save us. But if any of that is you, you need a Savior. And not just as an idea, not just as a general kind of uh, help me sleep at night idea. You need a person who showed up to save. See, we can try to reduce Jesus to an optional addition to an already fulfilled life. But if we sin, we need a savior, a sinless savior who took on the power and the penalty of sin. And a savior was expected in the time of Joseph. God's people had longed for a savior. The world was proclaiming that Caesar was a savior. A savior was looked for, but not like this, born in a manger. If you find it hard to believe, even if you concede, maybe I do need a savior, but hard to concede that a baby born in a manger is that savior, if that's surprising to you, it would have been surprising to the world when he was born as well. But Jesus is that savior. He's unlike the one who ruled in Rome or any would-be savior outside of him. He's the one who knew no sin, the one who cared for the vulnerable, the one who went to the outcast, the one who, who, who dined with those forgotten, the one who touched the leper, the one who noticed the blind beggar, the one who was tempted with riches and power and said, I would rather die for those in need than to have any of it. 
Though he was a king, he took the position of a servant and he was willing to leave the 99 to find the one. He moved all the way to us in love and he laid his life down as a ransom for many who took on the cross. And on that cross with his last words proclaimed the salvation that God promised he would bring had been accomplished. It is finished, John 19, 30. I can go on and on about his moral perfection, about his radical love, about his goodness, but here's the thing, and please listen to me, Jesus as an example will crush you. You'll never live up to it. But Jesus as Emmanuel will save you. The angel and the prophet declare in the names that God meets our disobedience and our failure with his provision. When people are disobedient, when when they sin, God doesn't walk away. He doesn't give up. He shows up and he saves. He's a savior who doesn't prepare a cross for us when we're disobedient. He's a savior who takes one on. So maybe the next step for you in this Advent, in light of everything else that's going on, everything that's right in front of you, maybe the next step is to get your head up and ask, is Jesus who he said he was again or for the first time? Because like Joseph, we're invited to interpret what we're currently experiencing in light of everything else that God has done and is doing. And let me be clear, the the names, that, that, that the angel gives, Jesus, uh, that the prophet gave, Emmanuel. They didn't change the circumstance for Joseph. They didn't make the situation easier. They just helped him have enough information to move forward with confidence because it was in line with the character of the God he puts his faith in. I've been thinking a lot lately about my mother-in-law who we lost a couple of years ago. And one of the things that I loved most about her and miss most about her is how predictable her love was. How, how she seemed so consistent in her love. You could almost set your watch to the time that the happy birthday text would come the morning of your birthday. Or the call would come, how did the test go? She, she was always available to help and she always dropped everything to, to come help when someone was in need. I was I was always amazed at how predictable her love was. Joseph did what he did because of a God who is predictable in his love. And he heard the angel declaration and he looked up and despite his circumstances, he recognized God still acts according to his character. He's still the God who saves. And that moment moved him to do more than just sit on the sideline of God's plan. He, he, he got up and he took part in God's plan, his part in God's plan. And he remained faithful to Mary. And he protected her and he protected her baby. So Mary, the, the pregnant mother, and Joseph by her side, the poor, shamed head of the household, the head to the ancestral home of King David, to Bethlehem where Jesus, the Savior, is born. Head up and go. And here's the thing for us. We can't be Jesus. That job's taken. But we can be Joseph. I heard an interview recently from a lady named Regina Dugan. She is the former director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, if you like acronyms. They develop all kinds of incredible things like uh, a robotic hummingbird, uh, prosthetic limbs that work just by uh, hitting the neurons in your brain, the internet, they, she was involved <laughs> with that. Uh, and, she, and she said this, what would you attempt if you knew you couldn't fail? If you ask that question, you begin to understand how the fear of failure constrains us how it keeps us from attempting great things. And in her words, life gets dull. Amazing things stop happening. Sure, good things happen, but amazing amazing things stop happening. What amazing thing are you doing right now that you couldn't do without God's help? If the answer to that is nothing, it's possible that you haven't gotten your head up in a while 
that you've thought only about the circumstances right in front of you and you've forgotten to remember his faithfulness. And maybe forgotten to remember your faithfulness matters too. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what keeps you up at night. I don't know what shame you are privately or even publicly carrying around with you. But you're invited to be a part of God's salvation work, just like Joseph was, to have your faith translate into actions, to have your head up and go. So I, I don't know if they'll forgive you if you say sorry. I don't know if they'll say yes if you invite them to church. I don't know if they'll say thank you if you sacrifice for them. I don't know how soon it will feel easy if you let go of that thing that you've been numbing out with, how, how, how quickly or if ever it will feel easy to let go of that. I don't know if your boss will notice if you give your very best for every single moment of work you possibly uh, can. I, I don't know. I just know those things are worth it. Forgiving, inviting people in, showing gratitude, connecting and serving others, seeking freedom from addiction, working with integrity. I know those things are worth it because I know the one who said they're worth it. These can be our head up moments. Advent can be a head up moment for us. Joseph was willing to look up and see the truth of who God is in the midst of his uncertainty. When what was right in front of him looked so bleak, almost impossible, he looked up to see a God who was with him and who saves. And he decided to take an active role in what actually led to his salvation. So regardless of the circumstance, maybe in light of the circumstance, what role is God asking you to play in your salvation? What is he asking you to say yes to? What is he asking you to, to, to say no to in light of Jesus coming to save us? Where have you settled for a lesser savior? Where do you need to look up and see that God is with you? God hasn't walked away and he hasn't left you to figure it out on your own. Jesus has come to save the people from their sins. So let's be people like Joseph who are faithful to the part that God has given us to play, recognizing that significance, it doesn't come from a long biography, it comes from faithfulness to the part God has you to play. We would do well to imitate the humble carpenter. Head up and go.
Thank you so much for joining us today. Now hear these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, go in God's peace. This service is ended.